typically the food industry is one of the slowest industries to adopt to technology. And certainly COVID expedited some of that. I mean, right, they right. pushed push people along mm -hmm. because we're not doing all the, the minutia that has is taking us time every day. We're putting our resources into growth and into efficiency. Hi there, food enthusiasts. Thanks for tuning in to Future Foodcast, where thought leaders in today's food industry discuss the trends and technology that will shape the future of food. Today, we are speaking with Marsha Woods, who's CEO and co-founder of Fresh Spoke. So how are you today, Marsha? Well, I'm great. Thanks so much for asking, and uh, thanks for having me on the podcast. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, well, we'd love to have you here. And I had done the briefing call early with you, and I know we could talk for five hours, but I know we also won't be able to go that long. So with that in mind, um, tell us um, a little bit about how you founded Fresh Spoke, what you're doing there, and what the uh, focus of Fresh Spoke is actually in the marketplace. Sure. Um, so, so Fresh Spoke is a, a wholesale and now a direct-to-consumer marketplace. And we give make it really easy for buyers to be able to source local foods um, and then be able to get them delivered to the door. And the real key to what it is that we do is, is really in how our technology is built um, and, and where the emphasis of our technology is on. And that's on the logistics side. And so you know, our whole secret sauce of the technology that we built is that we actually tap into excess capacity in commercial delivery um, to fulfill our orders to our customers. So instead of putting more trucks on the road to deliver local food, and we all see those trucks every day on the highway. And if you're ever wondering, my goodness, I wonder what's inside those trucks. A lot of times they're traveling either 40% empty to fully empty. So we tap into that excess capacity and we use that to coordinate our deliveries to the door. Excellent. So, um, so your focus, as you said, I think earlier is really what I call last mile delivery you know, from distribution centers out to retail, or sorry, out to different outlets and also direct to consumer as well? Yeah, so, so um, you know, we, we started out in 2016 as specifically wholesale and, and then the pandemic changed that. We actually realized that we wanted to open up more sales opportunities for our local food suppliers. That's why we got into direct to consumer. But again, that same truck that's heading in that same direction, we leverage that for both our home and our wholesale deliveries. Um, and uh, because it requires the same temperature, it's heading in the same direction, it makes sense that we, we use those trucks to do that kind of work. Yeah, so it's an interesting thing because when you're doing that, you really have to have sort of, a, I'll call it a, an inventory, if you will, of sort of all the trucks that are available, not just you, you, the ones you have, but also other trucks that are out there. So you have some sort of an enrollment process. Is it whole companies that enroll or individual trucks or how does that work? So it, it can be a combination of both. So, so to give you an idea of like who, who makes, and it's often a question, so who are your drivers, right? Who are these right. people that are driving for you? So in, you know, obviously with home orders that are local, then, you know, it could be somebody with a car or an ambient van because they're going with a tote that's already got, you know, cooling materials inside of it. But if we focus strictly in on the wholesale, because that's really the challenge in the market is really that wholesale side. Um, it typically is. It can be um, individuals who have a fleet of trucks that are already heading out to retailers across Ontario. Sometimes it's an independent operator who's, you know, a one he has a, he has a refrigerated or an ambient van um, and wants to do commercial deliveries. Um, in other cases, and this is the piece that I love the most, is it's other food companies. It's food companies that have already invested in that. Um, that infrastructure, the, all the, those assets, those trucks, and they're already heading to Sobeys or they're already heading to Healthy Planet or Loblaws or wherever they might be heading and um, are looking to leverage their excess capacity. And, and they do that for a couple of different reasons. You know, some companies are doing it because they're trying to offset cost and there's no question about it. Our model puts more cash in their pocket and helps them to offset their own delivery cost. But the other side of this, and I think this is the piece that's most exciting, is, is the fact that more companies are looking at this um, as a way to address climate crisis, right? We, we, we all have a responsibility 
to, to do our part, uh, whether large or small, to offset the, our carbon footprint. And there's nothing more egregious, in my opinion, in the supply chain than you know, an empty truck rolling down the highway that could potentially take um, cargo from point A to point B. Yeah, and you're right. That's So there's really, I'll call it at least three or four things there. So you're certainly providing more effective service to consumers because you're in a sense you're increasing delivery capacity to the consumers from what the trucks are normally because you're now adding more loads into them. The other thing is those, in a sense, um, other companies, as you say, are able to reuse their capacity, which lowers their net overall cost because they're getting paid for that extra capacity now, which is a good thing. And as you said, the climate change impact is obviously very clear because you're running closer to capacity, which is a win. The last thing is hopefully you're making money out of this too as a company as well uh, to continue funding your growth and everything else and the investments you've got to make. So it's really, uh, it's a great story because there's a lot there um, that hits a lot of different areas in a sense and from a value perspective, which is pretty unique, I guess. So tell me a little bit, given what you have been successful with, you're in, is it the Toronto market that you're primarily focused on now? Or so we, yeah, we're across Ontario right now. So, so you had mentioned, you know, from the DC, and I think that's sort of an interesting piece, right? That, that distribution point where food actually starts. And, and in our particular model, we service all of Ontario right now from Barrie, but, but ultimately that is not the model of the future. You know, what we're building is distribution as a service that mm -hmm. would um, enable us to actually have distribution points or, or uh, to service specific market clusters so our next um, development will be in the Ottawa area. So we're in Barrie now, we can service the greater Toronto area feasibly from the Barrie, Barrie area. But it's, you know, it, again, it's, it's not economical, it's not a good business model to service the Ottawa Valley to, to say um, a Montreal corridor, where there's lots of demand there for food um, and specifically local foods. So, so our model is very much, um, yes, we'll continue to service Ontario, but we'll service it through a mesh network of pop-up of pop-up uh, distribution centers or warehouses with three, three temperature warehousing um, so that we can actually service those markets in a much more nimble way and a right. more responsible way. Um, and, you know, you, you think about it, the way that the model has typically developed um, in Canada specifically, and certainly in the U.S. is probably no different, but it, we always think everything comes out of this big monolith of a distribution center. Um, and, you know, our, our thesis or our argument is, that when it comes to local food, when, you know, fresh local food on a just in time system, which is the way that grocery stores work, right? People right. think that a grocery store takes a pallet of something. They don't. They take two cases of something every few days or once a week. And so for a, for a supplier, that is extremely challenging when you have a location and you're trying to deliver to in Windsor and you have another location in Ottawa. That is in, a, in essence, the big distribution challenge. So with our mesh network, it's almost like all of that distribution um, functionality all exists in the cloud now. And, yeah. and we now, within a matter of months, we can pop up in anywhere with a 15, 10, 15,000 square foot facility, we can pop up, put temperature storage, uh, temperature uh, storage into those facilities and be up and running very quickly because the, our technology does all of that heavy lifting that those DCs typically would have done. So, you know, long, long winded answer to your question, but we do service all, all, all of Ontario. Um, and it will become more, and now we're focused on growth and efficiency. So that efficiency means we need more of these pop-up distribution centers servicing market clusters across Ontario, because Canada, unlike the U.S., is extremely geographically challenging, right? We're yes. so far between markets. You know, when I, we were doing business in Ohio, right, you'd be like an hour between major cities. Here, you're, you know, you practically have to pack a lunch, <laughs> <laughs> to get from uh, yeah. one to another. Yeah. No, actually, I'm familiar having been through, I call it most of Canada, with the exception of the very northern parts. You're right. It's amazing. In a sense, as you say, geographically challenged. It's a nice way to say, boy, you drive a long time without seeing people. So, you really uh, do. 
Yeah, yeah. So it, it is, but I mean, it's a great country, but it's very different than the U.S., where we're so dense in most areas, and we do have some that are more rural, but most of the U.S. is very, very dense by comparison. So it yeah. is pretty cool that you have a model that actually works for that kind of a geography, which, and I'll call it well suited to that. Following your idea of the pop up, if you start a pop up, you know, say in Montreal as a warehousing facility. How, in a sense, do you, in a sense, engage the market there? Because now you have all of these retail outlets that you haven't done business with. But now you're available, you have capacity, you have the free temperature warehouse, you're ready to roll. You've got to find the retail outlets, you've got to find the trucking companies there and reach out to them. How does all that grow in your end? Yeah, so it's always chicken and egg. You know, when you're a two-sided marketplace, in our case, to a certain extent, we're arguably a three because we also deal with drivers, buyers, and suppliers, right? We bring three yep. sides together. Um, so, you know, this is part of, you know, this is part of the growth strategy. Uh, you know, we have the big key pieces, of course, it, ensure that you have at least one side of that market um, uh, covered. And in our particular case, you know, we have um, an adequate supply of in-demand products and we're, and, and again, it's about knowing the market you're going to and looking at the feasibility and the market opportunity that exists there. So, uh, you know, I'm going to give you a real example. We're already going to Ottawa. Uh, we're already getting uh, pressure to go to, to um, Montreal. Mm -hmm. So we already have market opportunity there. We just we're addressing it either right now in a less efficient way or right. we're not able to address it at all, which is the, would be the case in Montreal. So in our particular case, it's really the network effect that tends to, we tend to fall back on to determine um, our growth strategy because oftentimes those suppliers already have demand in those markets. And so it's the demand that's coming from those markets that's going to determine where we go next. And that's really the, the key growth strategy. So the chicken is the supplier. We, we have the supply, we have the products um, that we need to move into those markets. Right. Um, we still obviously have to build a certain amount of uh, momentum on the sales side, but we've already done that. And we have our playbook that's worked exceptionally well with for us in, in, in Ontario. So on the, right. So going out to the customer side of this equation then, um, do you have like a direct sales force that reaches out to outlets in an area? And then do, is there any way that, um, I'll call it, that's a more of a push strategy. Do you have a pull strategy where in a sense outlets can find you as a service? Um, yes. any ways that they sort of, if I were an outlet, how would I know, um, easily that I have this cool opportunity to lower my shipping costs in a sense? Yeah. So if you're, if you're a, if you're a merchant, so if you're if you're a supplier, um, it's a little bit of a different case. They're always looking for distribution as they right. grow. They sort of are dependent on people like us because we we you know we can scale their brand much faster. But if you're looking at it specifically from the merchant side, that's where we're really different, right? We, you know, people want to put us in that pigeonhole of you know you're a distributor. So we say oftentimes, yeah, okay, if you need us to be a distributor, we're a distributor because that's right. we do what distributors do, but we do so much more. We're that's why we more refer to us more as distribution as a service because there's so much more to what it is that we do. So in our particular case, we are an online marketplace. So, so we take advantage of all of the digital opportunities that exist for us as a digital marketplace to be able to reach um, markets organically as well as through paid um, online um, advertising to be able to draw those merchants in. Um, the other piece though that works really well for us is our socials. And so we have Local Point, which is a brand of ours that also drives a social engagement around brands. So uh, for those folks from a consumer pers perspective, so to your point, that's the pull, right? We can pull mm -hmm. people in to the retailer um, through that brand to let them know that, you know, Dundurn Market in Hamilton is carrying this particular type of fish. Um, they can they can now know that because they've seen it through socials and somebody shared it, somebody's liked it, there's an engagement happening there. So that's where it gets really different because typically distributors sit in the background and people don't even know they exist. They don't really right. play in the marketing space, if you will, or the digital social space. Whereas we feel that that's something that we just as a partner, as a supplier partner, we have a unique opportunity to support those sales through doing that type of thing for sure. That's a great idea. I 
and I will say that's, um, I'll put innovative in a significant way. It's not that nobody else has ever done it, but you're right that that's not what you look at the distribution channel to do. You have this very narrow role, which is, hey, move the goods from point A to point B and make sure it's cheap and get it done. But you're right, the idea that you're actually helping drive, in a sense, um, I'll call it customers to those retail outlets to create the demand for the stuff that you're moving through is yeah. really, really smart. Uh, that's a double win for them. Yeah. And I think, I, you know, it's the one thing that strikes me is, you know, how, how come we're doing it and other people aren't? Well, I think part of the issue is that, you know, we, we've relieved a lot of the hands that are involved in our operation by automating it through technology. Typically, the food industry is one of the slowest industries to adopt to technology. And certainly covid expedited some of that. I mean, right, they right. Pushed, pushed people along, but it's still quite surprising as to how far behind um, the food industry is and in terms of its adoption to technology and automation and AI and all of those amazing things that we talk about every day at Freshboat. But in our case, you know, we, we invest in those types of activities Mm -hmm. Because we're not doing all of the manual stuff that the minutia that has is taking us time every day. We're putting our resources into growth and into efficiency um, and, and because we can, because the technology is doing a lot of that heavy lifting for us. Yeah, it's really cool. So uh, um, that is a big win. And you're right about the uh, food supply chain. I and mean, that's actually... I work with Paramount Software and they're actually building a farm to plate solution to solve all of that same kind of thing. There's growers and, and producers all over the world that need to get their goods somewhere. And in a sense, having an uh, affordable integrated supply chain uh, that doesn't cost an arm and a leg that can tie to everything else is, is a huge gap everywhere. So you do find, I'll call it the larger companies. Here's a Walmart, here's a Maersk shipping line. They have their own, what I call centric networks that they are, those are networks. But for the most part, they're, um, and they've opened it up a little bit, but they're not easy networks to get into in a sense. There's a high cost of entry and all that kind of stuff. Where your thing, it sounds like it's a, um, it's nice because it's locally focused. It adapts to the local market better, I think, than some of these larger um, solutions would. And um, it sounds like it's, from your point of view, it sounds like it's very efficient. So it sounds like a, a quote, a, from a business perspective, forget the technology for a second, because it, it, you're using technology, I think, in the right way. You're building a better business pipeline, so to speak, which is pretty cool um, with a lot of features on it. You're not inventing technology. <laughs> you're just applying the technology well for impact, which is pretty nice. And you don't see, uh, it, there's not as many companies that are able to do that effectively. It doesn't mean that they don't try, but it's not easy to do that, as you know. Well, no, <laughs> it's not. I, I... I knew nothing about logistics uh, when I started this business. And when I started looking into this problem in 2016, um, I was, certainly wasn't thinking about logistics, never thought in a million years that, you know, I'm a marketer I, and I love technology. And, and so that's always been my kind of wheelhouse. And I've never really focused in on logistics, it, but ultimately that is the crux of the problem. And as you said, Jim, there's, there's, no, there's no difference in what strata you're in in the supply chain. Transportation and logistics is, is a beast to wrangle. Um, and there's so much inefficiency and waste because we're, we're not interconnecting. We're not leveraging any part of the sharing economy to, to sort of share an asset and you know, hitch a ride instead of having to go out and invest in all, all of that expense. If, if we just create these interconnected systems, these mesh networks and, and share this information, it's amazing what we can actually accomplish. But again, it's, you know, it's that need to, you know, I, I, you know, I, I, this is the way I've always done it. Um, it's a big problem. I don't want to solve it. I just want the easy way out. And it's easy for me just to dip, book a dedicated truck that's going to take my thing, my particular thing from point A to point B. That's the easy way out. Um, if for sure, I'm not suggesting it's, you know, it's that it is easy. It's just easier than what, what we created. The work for us though is done. And, and so once you've got the system working, which took us a long time to really iterate through a lot of the challenges, no different than any other technology company. But again, 
it, it's it, he, we're here now and, and it's working and people can get in the truck very easily and we can really decrease the amount of food miles that, that we're, um, that are impacting our carbon footprint every day just by sharing these trucks across multiple suppliers that are going to the same store. Yeah. So we don't chase each other down the road to go to the same store. It's, yeah. uh, it's really silly sometimes. Yeah, you're right. So the impact is a huge one for about everybody in the end because it's a big thing to be able to help the environment uh, from everyone's perspective. The thing that you talk about, there was one word I'll pick out you use. It, it sounds like I've worked in IT uh, more than I call it most people have been alive, I'll say. And there's a lot of things that have happened. And I have, in my career, worked on integrating a lot of systems with different types and so on. Even before the internet existed, used to build custom networks that did this kind of thing. Um, but that said, the key word is uh, uh, integrated and interconnected. Yes. So what, what happens is, in some cases, I may, let's, and help me out, walk me through conceptually how this solution works. So let's say, if I'm an independent driver, I'm going to guess I could register with you somehow and say, hey, I, I'm an independent guy doing local trucking in this area, and it looks like I can get work from you. So I'm going to register with you. And if I understand it right, there's an app that I get that helps me integrate on your end because I'm just sort of a standalone guy with a truck, right? Yeah, there's there is, and 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 you know, it is it is we define it as uh, and explain it more as distribution as a service, and it's really a suite of services, right? So right. so typically, what would happen is it all starts with an order, um, and and so let's say for example, you're a small mom and pop. Um, operator in Smith Falls, Ontario, and you want to order, um, you know, some dumplings and some granola and some, you know, some, some um, you know, ravioli and some lettuce from these different suppliers um, that were, that are carried on fresh spoke. So typically, you know, the first piece of our technology is the e-commerce marketplace. And that's no different than Shopify or any other e-commerce experience that anybody might have. The only difference is we were, are both web and mobile. So those orders come into our system, web and mobile, into, our, our, um, in, into the engine, which is really our, you know, our order management system. But you, the, the key piece of this is, is what happens to that order when it hits our, our system is it now gets pushed to our load board it automatically gets analyzed for a whole bunch of things for the temperature of the product where it's going to and then it takes what that delivery schedule is and we that's all part of our technology and then it pushes it to our logistics load board and our load board is an amazing piece of technology that analyzes and automatically assigns and groups that assignment that particular order I should say with it with the assignment that's makes the most sense geographically for it to go with. Then that assignment is then um, available for that particular driver. And, an, and our logistics coordinator can make a decision at that point as to whether or not that order is gonna go out to our load board for um, a, a random driver to take, or mm -hmm. is it gonna go to a particular driver um, that, we're, that we want it to go to, and then they would assign it. As soon as that happens, the, and that driver accepts that assignment, then the assignment, it gets pushed to the, their mobile app. And right. they would only have the mobile app if they were an approved driver to your point. So everything happens through our Fresh Dispatch app, which is our driver's app. And that driver can download the app. They can apply as a driver through Fresh Spoke. We would collect all of the things that you would expect us as a, as a food company to collect in terms of, you know, their equipment, their, their license, their insurance, you know, their experience, all those types of things. Um, and then once they become approved as a driver, they would see only those orders that they have the equipment to take. So if I only have an ambient truck, I'm not going to get products. I might get a granola, you know, a big, huge shipment of granola and maybe some crackers and anything, some beverages that are ambient but I would never see the orders that I couldn't deliver because I wasn't refrigerated. Yeah, very cool. Um, a very interesting system. So with all of that, um, you have drivers for these different areas um, that you build, you have a whole history on these drivers, right? Correct. So, yeah. And what you get probably, I'll guess, is a level of, uh, call it efficiency. You can see based on load delivery and everything else, right? You, 
you, in a sense, say, Jim, here's a load. I can come pick up a load. So first thing you do is, in a sense, make the load available to me to, in a sense, accept the load, right? So that's the first thing that happens in the scheduling system. The second thing is I finally arrive, pick up the load. Then the third thing I do is I deliver the load to the different places I'm going. And along the way with your system, maybe I'm picking up additional loads on my route. Yeah, that's a, That's certainly something we, we do it internally. So our drivers do backhaul. So, so um, that's not atypical. So they could be dropping off and picking up along the way. Um, and that's all happen, has happened in layers of the evolution of our technology. So sort of version 1.0 of our load board and fresh dispatch system was very much just hey, let's just get the order from Fresh Spoke out to the buyer. And right. now we're at a stage where we're actually backhauling. So today, for example, um, our drivers are, are um, down in um, south, southwestern Ontario. They're picking up frozen corn and they're picking up a garlic sauce from Bobby's uh, today. And those will be backhauled into Fresh Spoke. So our trucks are never empty. Um, we take full advantage of the backhaul to bring products back into our warehouse that then would then get distributed out. The other thing that you had mentioned, I think, which is, is super cool about our system is, you know, proof of delivery is always a real pain um, in the marketplace for suppliers. And so because everything is happening in real time through our app, our driver's route is always optimized, first of all. So it optimizes the route. So the driver doesn't have to think about where do I need to go first? Um, the next thing is, as soon as that driver collects, um, you know, hands them a bill of lading and an invoice, and they get that signature, they just simply take a picture of it and load it to our system. And we know right away that the order has been delivered and there's a proof of delivery right there. So for a lot of suppliers, that's key because as, as, you, as, as anybody in the market knows, that's when the clock starts ticking on when you're going to get paid. So the right. sooner you can get that closed, the better. So all of those types of things are all contained within the system. And now with um, optimiz further optimization, we see lots of opportunity to use that kind of data of this, these drivers to, you know, if, if we know that you're going to sit an hour um, at a loading dock and we start to see a pattern it, through, um, through good analysis, we can start to say, hey, wait a minute, maybe it's not a good idea to send that driver to that particular location on a Wednesday at 11 o'clock because yep. they typically wait too long. We could optimize the route and send them a different way and they could do two other stops and then hit that one. And even though it's taking them maybe five kilometers out of their way, they're going to save a whole bunch of time and, and money and get squeeze one more delivery into that order. So there's just so much opportunity that comes from technology in terms of analyzing data once you have it. But the key here is, you know, who holds that? And, and, and that's why another reason for us to do as much as we can with technology means that it helps to make us smarter too. Yeah, so, um, so you, you're automating and you've integrated, I'll call it all this behavior of what I call these independent actors. You've got drivers that work for the company, independent drivers that are for other companies who are picking up loads and so on. Because you have all that data, um, it sounds like it would be pretty easy to figure out, in a sense, not just, as you say, rerouting and, and better scheduling loads, as you, say, as you said in your example, to improve overall uh, throughput on the system in terms of getting things done. So I'm not sitting in a queue somewhere. But the other thing is you also get a sense because of the data you're capturing about, I'll call it driver behavior as well, right? So you can see, and so that leads to a question of, are there incentives in your system at all for the, the in a sense, the truckers, the drivers? How, do, how does that work if there is anything? Yeah, we've driver's perks. We call them driver's perks. Um, yeah, and, and, and I see, I'm with you. We, we're not there yet, but I see lots of opportunity that if you've got a driver that's just stellar, right? Just performing, you right. know, at top notch. I think there's lots of opportunity there to be able to reward uh, drivers, um, you know, good behavior. Um, you know, we talk so much about, you know, punishment. And, and so there's so many ways that, you know, through that data and through analyzing, you know, speed and braking and temperature main, you know, and timing and all those types of things that you can do some really super cool things. We haven't done it yet. Yeah. Um, um, just because, you know, that it's just really, it has to do with the maturity of our company and, and where, our, what our current development roadmap looks like. Um, but, you know, again, it's, it's, you know, ha keeping those drivers engaged is really important. And we, and we see that as an inevitable evolution, 
um, because we don't do we do want to be sticky. We want to keep them coming back. It's it's important that our system be easy to use for our drivers. It's important, you know, that they're getting remunerated. It's important that you know they're getting a sense of satisfaction out of this process, or else they just won't do it. Right? Doesn't matter how how cool it is if it, right. if it doesn't do if it doesn't check all their boxes, they're not going to stick with it. Yeah, and, and you're right. And the other side of that coin is if I am a driver. It's not just how well do I perform, it's also how much do I like working with your system in a sense, right, compared to somebody else's. And if I say, as you pointed out, your system is a pain or it has these roadblocks or makes it difficult in some way, then um, I'm certainly going to say, gee, I don't really want to pick up those kind of loads if I can avoid them. So it, on your end, it's, it's, I guess, important to get driver feedback, not only from the company drivers, but from the external ones as well to say, hey, what are we doing? How do we do it better? Uh, do you survey drivers or anything like that? Yeah, we do. We actually did a project with Seneca College um, recently that that did exactly that. Is you know looked at the usability of the system, looked at sort of what what were what what did they what did they want to get out of it. Um, you know, listening to our cohorts, whether those be buyers, suppliers, or drivers, is really how we got this far. I mean, there's 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 no there's no real engineering in the system that's ever slam dunk without really listening to your customers. And so, you know, I'll never forget being in a room with a group of investors once and they actually said, after I told them how our system worked, one gentleman said, clearly, you know, nothing about transportation. And I said, you're right. I, I, I don't, I didn't know anything about transportation when I started this, but I listened to my customers yeah. and my customers said, this is how I want the system to work. So you're right. Did I do it like the way that the rest of the world works? No, I didn't. I did what my customers asked me to do. And it's the right. same thing with the drivers. As long as we're listening, really, really listening to what it is they're telling us, you know, then, then we can create a system um, that, that, that will do what they expect or what's intuitive to them to, to be done. And that's the key because, you know, until you're actually out there and, and, and I, I go out and drive. I mean, I'm the CEO and I still get in the truck and I go out and drive and I make deliveries because a lot of times that helps me just to understand, you know, what, yeah. what's the customer journey? What's the buyer journey? How, what's the product journey? Um, yeah. You really have to experience, experience it firsthand. And also, you know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a big believer and you don't ask other people to do things you wouldn't do yourself. So <laughs> yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah. And you're right. I, I know my, my father built his own company from the ground up and it was the same philosophy for him. It's he was always willing to do any job in his, his company, every single job. So if you couldn't figure it out, he'd come down and help you at whatever the, the problem you were having was uh, everywhere. And, and people didn't believe that somebody who was owning the company was actually willing to go down to the shop floor and either fix it with die or machine, tooling machine, whatever it was, a setup, that kind of thing. But yeah, if, if you want good results and if you have a focus on providing good service, you sort of have to have that flexibility. The other point you made, it can't get into it enough. Uh, right. I've worked uh, in my IT career with what I call experts who said, gee, that's not the way to get it done. But you're right. The saving grace is if you've got, I'll call it not one customer, but you're listening to what I call a large group of customers and they're telling you stuff and you're finding what's in common and you're just focusing on that you're never going to be less than a B plus on your worst day in terms of delivering what you're supposed to for sure, um, which is kind of a cool focus. So if you never lose that, um, you're always going to be on the right track for sure with that, which is pretty good. The other thing that's interesting. So as a driver, I'll have um, one of the things I'll have as a driver is a mobile app um, that integrates with me. Yeah. My guess is that your system um, beyond the software you're writing in house you must have an awful lot of uh, put different APIs and services that you integrate with. Yeah, we do. We use, uh, you know, we we use a, G, uh, a GIS system um, that that we integrate for, for. That's sort of the key, right? That's the backbone of our route optimization um, for sure. Um, and and we also obviously use other, you know, other uh, plugins and APIs that help us to, you know, improve our search, improve, you know. Um, um, uh, what else? And then, of course, commerce, that type of thing. But for the most part, you know, in our particular case, we have a pretty extensive and deep, um, it, deeply experienced team of, of developers who work exclusively with my co-founder, who is a software engineer, Henry Kwok. So Henry and our team of 10 developers 
um, who include both mobile, both iOS and Android developers, testers, full stack, everything is in our team. So we're really, really, really lucky, right? That, that we've been able to float our own boat, so to speak, um, in terms of developing this technology. Having said that, you know, I, we're at the point now where we're seeing all kinds of really interesting ways that we can integrate with other people and, and, and reciprocally, uh, reciprocally as well. Um, and, and I think it, it happens with most tech companies. You, you build to a certain extent on your own and then, and then you start to look at you know, lateral opportunity and that's really what we're looking at now. So you look at you know, the kind of AI technology that Google has, the kind of AI that Amazon has, and you're like, why would we go out and try and build everything when all of this is sitting there? So it's always it's always an analysis, right? Of do we build it or do we API into something else or do we do, do we invest in a plug in there? So th those are pieces that are that are always critical. Security is another huge issue for us. Yeah. Um, through, through the pandemic, I, you know, we, we, like everybody else, you know, ended up getting attacked by a bot. So you've got to be thinking about these types of things as well. So, so there's no question about it. You know, while we've, the core and the crux of our technology is all proprietary, um, there is massive opportunity out there with um, plugging into a lot of the really deep um, AI uh, um, engines that are out there that can help us to be even better. Yeah, so you did bring up security and I will say there's two different things to look at conceptually as an architect. The first thing is you sort of, at least at a bare level, I'll say there's three levels of security from a transmission perspective. So you have what I'll call it, uh, transport level security, which is things like VPN and so on. They lock out at that layer. But then above that, you have the application layer security, which is things like TLS, SSL, those kind of things that most of the internet runs on servers that way. The last thing, and I find this is hand handy in some cases, when you have um, applications that can get hacked, there's a what they call message level security that you can add on top of that. So I actually had pretty good luck encrypting um, and charting what I call content. So even if the network got hacked, you know, in my case, in some cases for really important stuff, you were never gonna get the data because it was message level encrypted on top of that. And then the third thing is um, as an architect for companies, they always ask me to say, okay, let's talk about end-to-end uh, -end coverage on the security. So talk to me about, in a sense, uh, we'll call it uh, data security for data at rest. How do you secure that? Is it encrypted data in flight, uh, which is me moving data over the network? And I just talked about those three models for that. And then the third thing now that shows up, which is kind of interesting, is um, I'll call it data in process. So in the old days, it's like I had it secured at rest. I had it secured in flight. But oh, yeah, when it's actually running in the computer, it wasn't exactly secured. And one of the interesting things um, with some of the newer technology that we have now in blockchain and some of the, I'll put better, um, I'll put, there's a, a short list of frameworks, let's put it that way, that actually can uh, accommodate some of these things, they call them trusted execution environments, TEE. But what that means is you actually execute a smart contract or whatever the application is uh, in memory, in a protected memory space um, that can't be hacked in effect, which is different than um, you know normal stuff that I would write. So you're typically on a server, I'll call it the uh, normal applications. Uh, if you've done all the other stuff for security, I'll call it reasonably secure. But what's mm -hmm. different about the TE uh, type environments is they're really fully encapsulated. And so you really can't, in a sense, hit that. So when you do a security audit kind of a thing, somebody says, hey, I want to compare you to something else out there in the marketplace. It's you set up that sort of a diagnostic, go through it and say, hey, here's how we stack up kind of a deal when you're, you're showing what you can do versus what other people can do in the space. Yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, that the, the security side it is definitely, in, you know, when you look at growth, growth stage companies, it, it, you know, security obviously is always, uh, is always a concern of any tech company. It should be, it should be, you know, right. in, in your top three uh, priorities. As you start to grow that security, that security, uh, challenge grows with you, right? It, it, yeah. it exponentially. And so there always has to be a focus on security. And in our particular case, you know, as we grow and we're doing com commerce is getting greater and greater, the, the need to, to protect the data um, becomes greater. 
processing, I, you know, is an, ex, an interesting piece. And that's, you know, I mean, we could get into the whole blockchain piece and I love the TE piece that you're talking about because that in and of itself is, is a challenge, right? It's a total challenge for companies because there's solutions out there for, for, um, for static data and dynamic data, but there is no, you know, there, that, that processing data is sort of that in-between stage. Right. Um, how do you protect that? But yeah, it's, it's um, definitely a focus of ours and security is part of our roadmap and to bolster our security in, in 2022 for that reason, because we're growing as a company and as we grow, the risk gets greater and we need to have our eye on the ball um, as every yeah. company should. Well, and the other thing too, and it happens, it's, I'm going to say it has nothing, it's not just security, but everything you do as a business, you're accountable to both your customers, your suppliers, and then finally to regulators and auditors and all that. So in all of that work, you always have to have extensive, in a sense, um, I'll call it uh, audit trails, in a sense of everything you produce. Blockchain's one way of doing audit trails, obviously it's effective, but there's other ways of doing audit trails. But regardless, you have to generate a lot of audit trails and provide that kind of capability to all of these different groups outside of your own operations team that's really looking to process the data for efficiency purposes, operations, service level, that kind of stuff. But um, you do have to have uh, quote, larger businesses as you're becoming, I guess, uh, all have these larger responsibilities around um, audit trails and everything else. So that's a big deal too. For sure. So it sounds like, uh, I'll say on your end, um, from, I guess it was 2016 and then founded in 2017 at that point, uh, you've come a long way in a short time as a technology company. Have we? <laughs> yeah, well, I'll just say you probably got somewhere, you probably got somewhere you're not supposed to be. Companies yeah, not supposed to be you know, that far down the road that fast. So I'll just push you back and say, slow down. You're yeah. at about the 10 year mark in about four years. So congratulations yeah, sure. your best. If this, yeah. was, if this was elementary school, you're like a third grader that I'm going to hand the sixth grade diploma to and say, hey, congratulations for finishing sixth grade, even though you're a third grader. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And I think it's always important to take stock and take these opportunities, right, where you get to actually think, hey, you know what, we actually did it. And we just went through an exercise, you know, because of Thanksgiving and the fact that we kind of launched our warehouse and everything in October, it was it was like what we, you know, looking and taking stock of everything that we've been through in the last 18 months, you know, directly and indirectly as a result of pandemic and changing markets and so forth. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting how rapid um, the changes and the pivots that we've made. But, you know, the one thing I have to say is I'm super proud of the team and how quickly they're able to mobilize um, when we identify an opportunity or when we identify a particular challenge, how quickly we tackle those things um, with meaningful solutions. And that's, you know, that's, that's the whole key. I think sometimes I find even in my own experience and working with other entrepreneurs, it's like we have this pig headed notion and the stubbornness that, you know, you've got this brilliant idea or you've got this somewhat great idea and you want to pursue that idea and people are giving you great advice and they're telling you, you know, how to make the idea work or how to make it improve on that idea. And you're just, you know, you become so entrenched into it that you're not making the pivots and the changes necessary to meet, to have a product that meets market fit, right? And in our particular case, you know, that's the one thing that I would say is, is been our, to our benefit is that both Henry and I, you know, are not afraid of change and we're not afraid to listen to what other people are telling us is working and not working and synergize that into how we're proceeding as a company. Um, we just wanna be successful and do meaningfully great work, right? And, yeah. and at the end of the day, you know, what good is it if, if, if my company isn't successful? I, that, you know, what defines that success? And so that in and of itself is something that we really feel strongly about is, is just listen to the market, do what the market wants and find a business model in there, right? That, 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 that there's a financial and a business model there that works, not just for one, but for thousands and hundreds of thousands of people. And, and that's um, you know, what, what we continue to focus in on all the time. And you know, by no means are we finished. Our roadmap gets longer. It doesn't get short, shorter. Yeah, yeah. no, but you hit on a key point. You talk about, everybody talks about the ability to change, uh, the, the capacity for change. The bigger thing is if you're in software like you, you are as a technology company, 
everybody who's, not everybody, I'll say the vast majority of people who are in software are fundamentally engineers at heart. They like to solve problems. So I'm, I'll raise my hand and say, oh, I'm an engineer too. I do that as well. The problem is, to your point, that we all have, we think we have great ideas as engineers. One key attribute that you hit, from my perspective, the way I look at it is, how fast can you give up your idea if a better one comes along? So if I have a great idea on how to do something and you come up in a meeting with a better idea, is it gonna take weeks for me to make that change or can I do it quick? And I guess what I'll look back and say, some of the best moments I ever had on my side of the fence were ones where I gave up my great idea in under 60 seconds when I heard your great idea. So that, and if you have a team that focuses like that, um, you're gonna go farther, faster um, on less gas, so to speak. It's like a high mileage car kind of a deal, which is a good way to run a team. So that's pretty good. So I like that approach. Yeah. So definitely, that's excellent. So um, you have um, a lot of things that we've hit about the business efficiency. Um, and we've talked about, um, on your end, we've talked a little bit about um, audits and the ability to track what you're doing and so on. So uh, do you want to relate that a little bit? Um, is there anything in what I call the health or foods uh, in the safety issue that you have to go through as a food distributor or handler, if you will, that you yeah, have so to comply with? Yeah, we do. We, we, we comply. There's, you know, there, whether you're, you're complying to a particular certification or whether you're, you're complying um, just as reasonably prudent professionals, you know, I, 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 I don't want to suggest tomorrow that everybody has to be BRC compliant or everybody has to be HACCP or GAP or whatever. You know, we're working towards BRC compliance because we just feel that that's what we need because that's what our customers are telling us that they, they expect of us, you know, in terms of our own growth. Um, but, you know, the key for us is, of course, you have to look at the goods you're dealing with. And in our case, we're dealing with highly vulnerable, high, high risk, I would suggest, in, um, products and that we de we deliver food and specifically we deal in meats and fishes as well. So in our particular case, food handling and, and safe handling of foods is really key for us. Um, and you know, part of the evolution, this sort of dovetailed together was the when we actually developed our own warehouses, we finally had the opportunity to be able to iterate that inventory management and traceability right into our system. Previously, when, when we were, you know, looking at a model in which even our warehouses were accessed, not ownership, um, like our delivery system, it just wasn't working for us. And as soon as we pulled it in and said, no, we need to manage this, this has to be, we have to have quality control, we need to have inventory management with traceability that, that follows and integrates with our own system for this to truly be to truly work. And this sort of actually happened at the same time as COVID, it was March, um, it was March, 2020. And it was like this epiphany moment where it was just like the only way we can really make this business model work is if we have these distribution points and an inventory management system that's traceable. So our system, when we take food in from a particular supplier, whether that's a producer or processor, we collect that information from the supplier on batch and expiry codes, and we follow that all the way through the supply chain and, and on a one step forward, one step back traceability system, which is the gold standard. Um, in terms of traceability. We use QR codes to do that with our, in, in our system, but everything is tracked right down to the actual, actual pack level. So, so we can actually say to Sobeys or say to any of our buyers with confidence that um, we have <clears throat> batch level traceability through our inventory management and we can trace everything and we can actually identify a particular batch and recall it within seconds within our, our system just by clicking a button and notifying all of those buyers that they have it. We fully complied with um, uh, um, the um, federal standard for recall. So we have class one, class two, class three recall notices built into our system so that that, that that's the way that the, the, the traceability can be uh, system can work. And ultimately what this does is it just helps us to, to instill a sense of confidence in the marketplace around these foods and around local food, not just what we're doing, but just the overall confidence in the supply chain. And we all know that 
you know, look at how, look at recalls in the past and how long it takes people to come back and have confidence in romaine lettuce um, after it's been recalled or, or cauliflower or whatever else has been recalled. Right. And so we have to have a system that responds quickly. We have to have a system that adheres to a particular standard so that we're monitoring temperatures in the trucks, we're monitoring temperature when it comes into the warehouse. We, we monitor and record all of, and document all of our temperatures um, of all of, the, you know, across the cold chain within our facilities, you know, ev every day, all day long um, to make sure that, that um, we're adhering um, to the requirements of that particular product to make sure that it's absolutely safe when it reaches the, cons it reaches the retailer. Um, we can't obviously to the consumer unless the yeah. consumer is buying it from us. But that's what our re retailers expect of us. And we think it's a reasonable expectation for sure. Yeah, well, that's great. So obviously you were just explaining that from a recall perspective, you're compliant with those different levels of recall in Canada as far as standards go. And what's nice is I don't know for sure. Uh, I do know the in the US we have something called the Food Safety Modernization Act that actually doesn't legally take effect till 2024. But what you just described is in there. Uh, yeah. Are you 100% compliant? Maybe, maybe not. I wouldn't know the details, but it sounds like you're, if you're not, you're really close uh, to what that's supposed to be in 2024. So it's the kind of regulation that will be required. And I think a lot of the companies in the food supply chain in the US are going to have some challenges trying to meet that. But it sounds like you're ahead of the curve in that space, which is nice. Yeah, we, we are. I think, I think we, we are, and we built the system so that we, that we, either exceeded, we either met or exceeded specific statutes within the legislation that, that are here, but also um, provincially and federally, which then aligned with the uh, USDA and also the European system, which is really, we look to the European system because it's really the gold standard in terms of uh, specifically on the, the notion of traceability. But I think one of the things that I think is really interesting is, is that it's the speed at which you can actually do these things that, that I think mitigates risk. That's where, where I think that companies like us can really, um, can really exceed expectation because we can respond really, really quickly because the technology actually knows where those products went. And, it, and, and because we are, it, it's, it's connected with the buyer's profile, um, we're able to communicate that recall very, very quickly. We can and 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 basically contain um, a particular spread much faster than a, a traditional, more conventional um, uh, uh, distribution system would would do. Yeah. So we have had recalls in the U.S. Not just romaine lettuce, but lots of other ones. And a typical one I just read recently, and it was about three years ago. They did a, had a problem with Bing cherries that were detected to be bad in a supermarket. They traced them all the way back to two source farms in California. Then they had to trace forward and say, okay, where else did those shipments go and were they affected? But the whole investigation literally run by the CDC in the United States, I think it took in the neighborhood of nine to 10 months to complete all of that. Because to your point, it wasn't readily available information. So there was a lot of it, manual work to pull all that together across all these different people in the supply chain. So it, it's not simple, but the fact that you can, in a sense, get it quickly out of your system is great. So when something comes in from a supplier, the supplier already has um, an identification probably in some cases on the product, whatever it is. If it's apples, it probably doesn't. But if it's if something else as a product that you're bringing in, it probably has an ID on the, on the thing already. But I'm guessing you're assigning a new item number in your system to track it. Yeah, so what happens is it basically gets bundled into, yeah, it, it, it actually takes and it creates a, a, a string of basically an alphanumeric string that, that identifies a whole bunch of things. And as, as that, that apple goes through the system, it picks up different, uh, different uh, points and different, um, it gets in, it encoded, if you will, um, based on wh where it is in the value chain across Fresh Folk and and sort of who handles it. So, you know, a particular truck, if it went into a particular truck with a particular driver and it was delivered to a particular buyer, all of that information gets encoded into that particular product in the string as it moves through the value chain. The big thing, though, I, I'll say that, uh, you know, I think still, you know, I, I don't want to paint this as being sort of the perfect story because I, I still I still maintain that, you know, your example of Bing Cherries is a really good example. 
you know, we, let's say we have a, you know, a trail mix that has those Bing cherries, you know, our, my concern is that the manufacturing side, you know, is the traceability there because we're, you know, you can only be an effective system is one step forward, one step back. This is where obviously right. blockchain can really be handy um, for sure. But in our particular case, you know, manufacturers really have to step up with the new legislation in 2024 um, and in, in not just here, but globally in terms of tracking those inputs, because that's an area where it can be very challenging. So, you know, those Bing cherries uh, found their, you know, they should know that they use those Bing cherries in the batch that came to us because we would have that batch code. So the key here is, do they know? Does it, where we can't have a break in, in this value chain um, we, because then it doesn't matter how good we are at fresh spoke at yeah. recall. Mm -hmm. If we have no idea that the cherries in our granola, granola were in fact on recall, then, then it's, we're, it, all is lost. So everybody has to step up to the plate. Now, part of it, of course, is, you know, it's part of our due diligence process to look at that manufacturing process, to look at, you know, where are you in a federally inspected facility? Are you HACCP? Are you GAP? Because if they are, then we already know that they, you know, that's part of the requirements of those certifications. But in many cases, small artisanal suppliers are just getting started, right? They, they yeah. don't necessarily have that level of sophistication yet, um, but they're getting there. And so it's that, that, that you got to work with a manufacturer or a processor to, to say, listen, you got to do this. You, you've got to know where your cherries came from. You got to know where your yeah. oats came from um, well, in each batch. Yeah, right. And so that's actually why Paramount put together this farm to plate initiative with blockchain as a service, if you will, because they're, what they're trying to do is link out to the guy who is that small supplier, or little grower or whatever. He has nothing. And so you're saying, okay, what if I gave you a mobile app that allowed you to, in a sense, generate the proper QR codes for what you're shipping us? And then we have it on a blockchain, to your point, so that everybody who's on that network that needs access can have access to it kind of thing, which is good. And it does make, then you've got a network level recall, um, which is really, I'll call it uh, uh, the next step up, if you will, because it's automated from one end to the other of the entire network as you yeah. plug more people into it, which is nice. Yeah. So yeah. that's really what the goal there is, is trying to get to that network level recall, which is cool. The other thing I was going to ask you, because you have a three, the other thing that's important about your distribution system, it is food. You have the three temperature warehouses, you say, the ambient, the other two, I think it's whatever it is, I'll call it refrigerated and then probably frozen, I'm guessing. Um, and so in that level, it's not just the fact that you're tracking something from origin to destination and have the transparency to show whoever you need to show where it came from and wh wh what happened. Uh, in a chain of custody, say it started here, you know, Jim's Peach Farm, it went to a canner, then it finally went to your warehouse, finally went to a retailer. The, the next step is to say, okay, but, and canned peaches are easy, but I'll say because it's ambient temperature, but if it was something like ice cream that has to be frozen, let's say, you'd want to be able to say, oh, it's not just that we've tracked it all the way through, it's that we can show you, uh, at least on your end, that while it was with us, it was below 30 degrees the whole time. And so it's those kind of proofs. Same thing with uh, medicine in the health uh, chain as well. You've got to say, hey, this medicine was kept at this temperature, like the Pfizer, uh, I forget what the Pfizer vaccine is, but it's supposed to be super cold. The Moderna is just whatever, uh, I guess, refrigerator or something like that. But you literally have to have those kind of proofs as well. So that becomes a challenging thing, of course, to do. So there is lots of room, as you say, to in a sense, sort of drive it down to the lowest level possible and say, ideally, we want everything end to end, not only to say it's traceable, but in a sense to say we've complied with whatever the handling requirements are end to end as well to build confidence. Yeah, for sure. And that's, I mean, it's it's the traceability piece actually out of those two pieces is, is, is more constant, right? The temperature... Yeah. There are a lot of outside influences that can can really wreak havoc, especially when it's temperature control product. Um, and you know, we we have we've had our share of of you know head scratching moments around you know how is it that this particular product you know a retailer will say to us this isn't at temperature. Well, how is that even possible? We look at the truck and the truck says you know minus we keep our trucks at minus uh, minus twelve to minus fifteen, and you know it's right. a chain so. But this is where, you know, this is where humans have to play a role, right? Where good standard operating procedures 
have a uh, have a place because at the end of it all and you know we don't we're not a robotic operation not at this point so we don't have robots running through our warehouse we have real people so when a product comes in you know to us you know there's still a, a visual inspection and there's still a temperature you know you still have to throw a gun into a box and 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 temperature check that product and visually inspect the product because you know there there are circumstances in which you just you know you 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 can't do it any other way, um, yeah. and, but you want to you want to mitigate that as much as possible um, and make sure that those records are there. You know, in our particular case, um, you know, we we still do the gun and we still do the vi visual inspection at the at receiving before it actually gets added to inventory for that for that reason um, because it's just the only way to do it, um, yeah. and but you got to do it. Yeah, no. So it's it's great that you are doing those things. You're right that when you look across the whole network, it's nice if at a point you could be able to integrate the whole network. And that's where I think we see the blockchain as a service kind of thing helping with that. But you're also right that there's this opportunity for more automation over time. So I've done device integration of a lot of things, POSs and stuff like that, uh, electronic scales and so on, uh, shop floor controls. And a friend of mine actually has put together a blockchain network, uh, not for food chain, but for oil field. One of the coolest things he did was he tried to make it, um, in a sense, fault tolerant, which is not an easy thing to do. It's one thing to say I automated something. It's another thing to make it fault tolerant. And what he did is he said, okay, I'm going to do uh, on wastewater in oil fields. They have to truck away the wastewater. And you get paid for that, obviously, and you have to dispose of it properly. It's all tracked. It's, you have to be licensed to pick up the wastewater. You have to be licensed to dispose of it. And there's a lot of money in picking up that wastewater properly. Um, so as a result, he said, okay, he put together not only a blockchain network to link the truckers and the um, disposal companies and the oil fields together, but what he did is they're all, they have tanks where they hold this stuff. He automated it with sonic um, sensors that can actually detect whether the tank is full or empty. So kind of like exactly your system, you yeah. get an order saying, hey, Jim, you know, there's wastewater over this field in Oklahoma. You can go pick it up if you want. I accept the order on my mobile app. I wind up picking it up. And to your point, what happens is when I when it gets clicked in that I've arrived at that tank, what will happen is the tank knows it's full. The second I click here and say I'm here and I've attached, the second the tank gets emptied, it says, okay, this load was assigned to Jim. Jim picked up the thing, it was full. Jim emptied the tank. So now the tank is empty. And what's so cool, the second it was empty, I'm taking the, the water off to the facility um, that's going to dispose of it. When I deliver that water, that tank to the facility, now my tank is empty. And then, it, believe it or not, I automatically get paid for that invoice on QuickBooks in like minutes, which is like, ooh, cool. I got, I did the work today. Oh, look at me. I got paid today. Do you know how nice that is for real people to say, it's not I'm waiting a month or six weeks to get an invoice paid, but I'm getting paid right away. That's a real win. But the, the thing that was so cool he didn't count on the fact he had done his own testing on the sensors and he did not count on the fact that a single sonic sensor could reliably work 100%. So what he did is he paired two together and he created his own little package. And so that what he said is it's a health check thing. So he knows from testing each center, each sensor on this network has an identity. And he knows he has the identity to run its health check and it'll come back and tell him they either worked or failed kind of a deal. But there are ways to automate things at a high level, which is pretty cool. Um, and uh, going back to your point that in the food supply chain, be able to not only say, hey, we did all this stuff, we know where it came from, we know where it went, but we can even prove to you that in a sense, we've maintained the right temperatures all the way through on delivery, which is really, really cool. And as a guy who gets the ice cream out of my local supermarket and finds out they didn't do any of that, um, I can't wait for the day that we get that kind of um, traceability and that kind of quality control going through the whole uh, food chain. It'll be a big deal. So, yeah, I think you know, and it, it, for sure, and and that's the piece. It's just you know, it. I I think it's super exciting when you think about the potential that you know a particular farmer's corn. To your point you know, that that particular corn, that somebody, as soon as they have that corn available, the, the person who's looking for that corn can find that, you know, those, that, that quantity is available from this particular farmer and that that corn can find its way all the way through to a consumer at the other end through a processed product and, you know, to a distributor and all the way through. And I think that's, that's really where the rubber hits the road, where we can, you know, where blockchain 
um, blockchain can really help to, to um, secure the integrity of the information, but at the same time, connect everything together that everybody can have confidence that that, that is in fact information that you can depend on. Um, but, it, but I think um, for, for us, like so many tech companies as you pick your battles and, and, and you know, we, we are, we're always looking to the next milestone, to the next piece, to right. the next, you know, innovation that we can, or iteration or efficiency that we can create through the, through technology. And, and, you know, this next piece to your point is there's, there's, there's a whole much more that a buyer or a, a, a supplier could benefit from technology. It's just a matter of, you know, continuing to evolve um, what you have into something even better and better all the time. And that's kind of where we're focused now is, you know, how do we be, how do we just be better um, at what, what we're doing? Um, you know, we've, we've tripped and fallen, we've made mistakes, we've pivoted, we've done this, we've done that. Now we've got a system that's actually working extremely well. Um, now, how do we scale this and, and make it even better? Yeah, no, it sounds awesome. So looping all the way back, I think it's very clear you have a, a really valuable business model. I mean, I realize it's primarily focused on Ontario right now, but it's easy to see, to your point, <clears throat> any area that is what I call geographically challenged, as opposed to someplace like New York City or Los Angeles or something, would really benefit from the efficiency that your type of service offers over the existing systems that are out there for sure. And that's, that's a lot of places, honestly. And then the other thing that's uh, amazing to me is like I say, <clears throat> you're actually more like that, um, I'll say somebody who's chronologically a third grader, but given your rapid technology uh, story in four years, you're kind of graduating sixth grade. You're not a third grader at this point, which is pretty amazing. So the speed with which your company has solved these problems is pretty impressive for sure. So. With that, um, you know, I, all I want to say is, you know, thank you, Marsha Woods, for coming uh, to Future Foodcast. It's been an awesome conversation. Again, I'll have to cut it off because otherwise I would just drift this <laughs> into two hours with you. And I apologize to the audience for that. Yeah. But um, I think Fresh Folk has done an awful lot really quickly to define a valuable service in the marketplace. As you say, it's distribution as a service, but it's more than distribution. You're providing a lot of, in a sense, related services around that, not only the climate impact, the efficiencies and everything else. But it's, uh, it's really neat to see a company grow like that. So with that, I want to thank you very much. Anything else on your end? You know, I, I just want to say thanks so much for the opportunity. And anytime you get to stop and pause um, and, and talk a little bit about what you've done and, and where you're going as a company is extremely helpful and satisfying. So I really do thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Thanks for listening to Future Foodcasts. Future Foodcast is powered by Farm to Plate, the leading food blockchain platform. Subscribe on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts to stay up to date with the very latest innovations in the food industry.